and as everyone knows that uh, uh, there's a hashing involved in Bitcoin and um, SHA-3 is obviously the new uh, protocol, uh, uh, new standard. If, if you're still using SHA-1 or um, MD5, yeah, uh, please don't. <laughs> yeah, so there, there will be slides about that. Okay, so I'd like to welcome uh, David Wong. Uh, David, it's all yours now. You have a mic on yeah, the podium? I think I have a mic. Yeah. Right? Uh, cool, so I'm kickstarting Crypto Talks again. So this is SHA-3 versus the world. Uh, so I came here to tell you a story and I always start with a timeline because I like timelines. Uh, in here I start with two hash functions, SNFU and MD4, uh, who were released in the beginning of the 90s uh, and were kind of the hash functions. There were a bunch of them, but there were not so many at the same time. Uh, and SNFU quickly got broken. So you might have heard of something called differential cryptanalysis, uh, usually used to attack block ciphers, but here it was used to attack this hash function. So that was pretty new, uh, got broken pretty quickly. MD4 remains unbroken for some years, so it becomes kind of the standard, the de facto standard at the time. Uh, MD4 is uh, one in a series of different hash functions, so of course MD5 is another one in the series. Uh, it's built, uh, was invented by Ron Rivest. Uh, there are a bunch of them, there's also MD6, uh, I think that's the last one. And it's all based on something called Merkle Damgard. So the MD here stands for Merkle Damgard. Um, so because it's not broken right away, it can sort of become the standard to, to, to build hash functions, and we get a bunch of other hash functions using this Merkle Damgard standard or construction. Uh, so that includes MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-2. We quickly realized that MD4 is not that secure, actually less secure than uh, SNFU. Uh, and MD5 as well, MD5, MD5 was more painful you might remember MD5, right? Uh, I mean, people still use it. Uh, but MD5 really used to be the standard. It was used all over the place, from code signing certificates to uh, certificates to uh, on the web or storing passwords. I mean, I used MD5 to store my passwords back in the days, uh, just because that's what the internet told me to do. So um, yeah, I like MD5 because everyone can, can remember that. Uh, SHA-1 got broken also. Who, who's actually aware of SHA-1 getting broken here? Quick show of hands. Okay, like half of the audience. Uh, so if you're not aware of SHA-1 getting broken, I think it happened February of this year, so that's pretty recent. Um, so team at Google and CWI in collaboration, uh, led by Mark Stevens, uh, ran this algorithm for something like a year on I don't know how many computers, and they ended up with two PDF, so you can have the PDF side by side here. Uh, pretty much the same content, but one has a red background, the other one has a blue background. And if you hash them with the, the same hash function, which is SHA-1, separately, you get the same hash, right? So two different inputs give you the same output, the same hash. So that's a collision. It's what is called a collision, and that's pretty bad. Um, usually for a cryptographically secure hash function, we don't want to find any collisions. So of course it's doable, but you don't want anyone to be able to find it even after running something for years and years and years. Uh, so here we say that SHA-1 is broken because of that. So deprecation of SHA-1 is, is pretty slow, but um, we got used to, to move away from hash functions with MD5, so we're better uh, this time around. SHA-2. So SHA-2 is built on top of the same construction, Merkle Damgard. It's the standard nowadays. Uh, you, you, wherever you are on the spectrum of security, you must have heard of SHA-2, or you must have used it, or you must have seen it. Uh, it's used pretty much all over the place. So the question is, is it going to follow the same fate? Is it going to get broken one day? Uh, and if so, do we have another standard to replace it? Do we have a backup plan? Uh, and that answer was not very clear. So what uh, the NIST organization decided to do, an American organization, uh, was to run the new, um, was to, to release a new standard called SHA-3. So that they, they're the one organizing uh, SHA-1 and SHA-2. But this time around, it would be an open competition. So SHA-2 is designed by the NSA. SHA-3 this time would be um, open to anyone who wants to participate. Uh, and that's pretty much what happened from 2007 to 2012. So that was five years. Um, five years in which 64 candidates fought against each other to become the new standard. And after three different rounds, uh, finally we have Ketchak who wins the competition. So nowadays, if you think about SHA-3, 
uh, you really think about Ketchak. That's the algorithm that won, that won the competition. Um, an Italian slash Belgium team, uh, I believe. Uh, so other candidates in the last round of the competition that didn't make the cuts were Blake, Russell, Jage, and Skyne. Uh, it's not that they were not secure, it's just that we had only one place, one position, uh, one winner, uh, so they just didn't make the cut. And actually, if you look at Blake, uh, you might have heard of Blake too. Uh, so Blake had had a second life after the competition, they just released a new version and people had, uh, a lot of people has, have actually used Blake 2 instead of uh, waiting for Shafi. Alright, so far so good. That was my, my introduction to Shatri. I'm going to spend the next few slides to try to teach you how Shatri works. Uh, don't panic, I'm, I'm not going to use math or equations or anything complicated. I'm just going to give you an intuition of how it works. So that's pretty cool. I'm just going to give you this idea and you're going to get out of this talk today with an idea of how it works. Um, and then I'm going to talk about derived functions. SHA3 doesn't come alone. It actually brings a lot of different functions with SHA3, with this hash function. Uh, that's, uh, that's very confusing for a lot of developers or a lot of pen testers like myself. Uh, so that's kind of a summary of what you're going to see more and more in the next coming years. And finally, if I have time, I'll talk about protocols derived from SHA3. So SHA3 doesn't only come with functions, but it also comes with protocols, entire protocols. Um, so we'll see about that. But first, I have to explain SHA3, so just focus for a few slides, but it's not going to be too hard. All right, so SHA3 is built on top of a permutation. So in cryptography, you have many, many fields. One of it is called permutation-based cryptography. It's basically a bunch of crypto built from a permutation. What is a permutation? I have a very easy example for you. Everybody knows AES, the encryption algorithm. Think of AES, um, the core AES function can only encrypt 128 bits, no more, no less, right? And it gives you 128 bits output, which is the ciphertext, all right? Also here, we just pretend that we have a key that is set to 0, 0, 0, 0. It's a known key, it's public. Uh, we don't really care about the key, it means everybody can encrypt, everybody can decrypt, okay? So that's what a permutation is. It's something that takes an input of some size and gives you a different output of the same size, but there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the, all the possible inputs and all the possible outputs, right? Because if you have different plain text that corresponds to different ciphertext, you don't know how to decrypt, right? So one-to-one. -one. So every time I'm going to talk about a permutation, you can think of AES with a known key. All right, so from that permutation, we're going to build something called a sponge construction, and it basically replaces uh, what was the merkle Dimegard construction. It's a new way to build the hash functions, and it was invented as part of SHA-3, uh, the, the competition. So here we take an input, and we, we set the input to all zeros, okay? I don't care the input size and the output size. Um, actually, Ketchak comes in ver various sizes, um, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but here, I'm, I'm just taking a small input size for, for the example. So I permute it, and I get something kind of random, okay? And here, I'm going to say that I divide my inputs into two parts, and I divide my outputs into the, the same two parts. I take the first R bits of my input, and I call that the rate, and I take the last uh, remaining R, uh, C bits of my input, or output, and I call that the capacity. And if you, if you look at the permutation like it's AES, uh, you would just divide the inputs and say just these R first bits are the rates and uh, the last is the capacity. Uh, I don't really like the rate and the capacity, that those words, because they're not very pedagogical. Uh, so I'm just going to call the R part, the this rate part, the public part, and you're going to see why. Uh, and the remaining bits, the, the bottom part, this is the, the secret part, and you're going to see why uh, also. So, okay, we're, we're going to define a hash function, right? SHA3 is a hash function, so how, how can we get a hash function if we don't have an input, right? It's not a good hash function if we don't take some, some input, some message we want to hash. Uh, so here, the, the easy way is just to take our message and to XOR it with, um, with the zeros, but only the public part, so we don't touch the secret part. What if our message is longer than this public part? Well, uh, we just split our message in, in sizes, in blocks of the size, the, the public part, and we just, after the permutation, we just XOR it with the, the public part again, and then we permute again. Does that make sense? 
So here, if my message is bigger and I have three blocks of message, I just permute again, I just XOR again with this public part, never touching the secret part, and I permute again. And I say that this process of just getting the message into my algorithm is called absorbing. Makes sense, right? It's a sponge, so we absorb the message. Now, how do we get an output? Right, it's a hash function, we got the input, but we need an output, right? We need a hash. So what we can do is just read the public part. And again here, that's why it's called public, and you never, never touch the secret part, uh, otherwise you, you have some security issues. Uh, if it's not enough, because, uh, I don't know, the, the size of the public part is not enough for, for your outputs, uh, because if you think of a hash, you have different sizes, right? You have SHA-3256, like SHA-2, and SHA-3512, so you have different sizes of outputs. Well, you just permute, and you continue to read the outputs, the public part, and you append that to what you had previously. And if it's not enough, you permute, and you read that, and you append that. If it's too much, you truncate. So that part is called squeezing. So again, it makes sense, right? It's a sponge. You absorb your message, and you squeeze your message. And you can pretty much do that uh, as much as you want, but for SHA-3, they do it only for 256 bits, 512 bits, uh, and maybe some other uh, size of outputs. Um, so yeah, any questions on that so far? Yeah? Um, the message, each time the whole message? Or I, I can repeat response? the question if you want. So is the message what? So the second time you respond, and the third time you do it, is it, is it different part, or is it the same part? So, so yeah, my diagram is not very good for that. So, so your question was, is that message always the same when you XOR it with the input, with the, the state? Right. So let's just say if it had, uh, let's just say the message has 10 bits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is it the first five bits have been sponged first and the next five bits have been sponged second or is it the five and the first five again and the first five again? Oh, you're right. So if this uh, public part is five bits and your message is ten bits, you just split your message in two, you XOR the five bits here and then you XOR the five bits here and you're done with the absorbing. Uh, I have a question. How is this different from SHA-1? Wasn't SHA-1 padding instead of XORing? So uh, SHA-1 used merkle dimer construction. So it's very, it's quite different. Uh, I cannot really tell you all the differences, but basically there is no secret part and there is no public part in SHA-1. Um, so when you, when you release the output, you just read, release the whole state instead of releasing just half or like some part of the state. Uh, so I'll explain a bit more about that later. Uh, but just, yeah, just here, the secret part, uh, I'm not gonna tell you where you make the division, but just know that for SHA-3, they kind of play where they, they, they divide this input and outputs, and the more, the bigger this part is, the bigger the secret part is, the more security you have. Uh, another question on that? All right. So, we have a paper proof that this works, that this is secure. Mathematical proof, as long as the permutation at its core is secure. Now, how do we know that the permutation is secure? Well, we don't really have a good way of doing that. Uh, the only good way we know of is just to try and break it, uh, try linear cryptanalysis, differential cryptanalysis, all the attacks we know of, and try to invent new attacks, and so on. So that's why the competition lasted for five years, lasted for so long. Uh, it's just that we're trying to break it, and after quite some time, we are more confident about the security of the, the function. SHA-3 has received a lot of cryptanalysis, uh, so this is a page on their web, uh, website uh, that lists all the papers trying to break SHA-3 uh, or KCHAC. And that's kind of why one of the reasons why it was chosen as the winner is because it received so much analysis. Why did it receive so much analysis? It's kind of unfair if you think about it. Uh, some other algorithms might have been as secure, if not better, uh, but they didn't receive as many cryptanalysis and maybe that's why they didn't get picked in the, the competition. So if you look at the list of inventors of Ketchak, maybe there is a, a clue in there. So inventors, all great cryptographers, right? Uh, Guido Bertoni, Johan Damon, uh, Michael Peters, and Jill Van Ash. Uh, but one of them kind of stands out from the rest. So can anybody recognize one of the names by any chance? Number three, Michael Peter? Number two, who is that guy? I would make him friends with AES. Yeah, right, yeah. Johan Damon invented AES. So when you have the guy who kind of sold block ciphers and who's trying to tackle the hash function problem, of course everybody's interested. Um, it's not only a popular contest, uh, SHA-3 or Ketchak was really interesting. His sponge construction, I just explained to you, 
was really interesting, so it attracted a lot of uh, attention. Okay, so recap, competition lasted for five years, from 2007 to 2012. Finally, in 2012, um, Ketak wins, is nominated as the winner, but we still don't have a standard, right? So people cannot use it yet. Three years after, so the standard took three years to, to come out, something is released, so the standard is released uh, under the name FIPS Pub 202. It's a pretty ugly name, pretty ugly PDF. Uh, if you look for this, just type SHA3 in Google. Of course, don't try to remember that. Um, so yeah, quite some time after. If you want to use it, if you want to see how it looks like, uh, there is the Kesha code package. This is the, the official implementation. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, I think I have a link at the end of the talk with a better, uh, a bigger font. So this is the reference implementation. You can look at it. Uh, there is another implementation, which is TweetFibs202. It's a Twitter account. It has nine tweets. If you concatenate them all together, it's an implementation of Shafri. <laughs> um, of course, don't use that, uh, but it's secure. It's made by Daniel Bernstein, DJB, uh, among others. It's supposed to be safe. It's just not the safe, uh, the, the fastest implementation you can have. So yeah, if you want to, if you like my slides on that Shafri uh, construction and you want to know more, you can actually read the code and it's not that, um, that big. It's not that scary. Okay, so I have another question for you. Where is SHA-3 being used? So it's pretty recent, two years, or kind of three years old now. And um, I'm going to show you a list of hints. And the first one can shout uh, maybe somebody or some application that actually used SHA-3 uh, gets a beer from me. I mean, I know we have free beers, but in the pub after. So yeah, some crypto-friendly application something modern, something recent, like kind of bleeding edge. Blockchain. Blockchain. Who said that? You? Yeah. All right, free beer. Just talk to me after. <laughs> so yeah, if you didn't recognize these uh, logos, I, I don't know all of them. I think this is Monero, Ethereum, Ethereum, which, which is going up today. Bye. Uh, but yeah, a lot of these uh, cryptocurrencies, um, ledger stuff, blah, 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 are using SHA-3 because they're pretty recent. These people, no crypto, so they know that the standard is out. Um, so, so, so yeah, they're using Shatter. There is Tor also, the Tor browser, right? The thing to be anonymous on the internet. Uh, has released a version 3 specification, I think a week ago or maybe two weeks ago, I'm not sure. And they use Shatter in the new specification. So really recent stuff tend to use Shatter. Okay, so that's it for Shatter. And now I'm going to move away from SHA-3 and kind of talk about different things. But I'm still going to talk about the standard SHA-3. So if you look at the standard SHA-3, it says uh, permutation-based hash, all right, that's what I talked about. And then it says extendable output functions. So what is this thing, extendable output function? So if you look at that standard, there is SHA-3 and there is also something called shake. And shake is not SHA-3. It's a soft, it's an extendable output function. I don't actually, I don't know if you're supposed to say soft, soft, I don't know, it uh, doesn't matter. And it's something that you can use like a hash, but basically your output can be whatever length you want it to be. So it could be one byte or a million bytes or something in between. Of course, don't use one byte, it's not very secure, but it's more flexible. You can use it, you can abuse it for many different things. You also have different parameters. Um, unlike SHA-3, which has absurd, an absurd security, I'm not going to explain that, but uh, basically SHA-3 was criticized a lot because of the security it targets, which makes SHA-3 slow. Shake has more uh, realistic targets. So it mirrors uh, what you see with AES, AES-128 and AES-256. You have Shake-128 and Shake-256. So it's more realistic and it's faster. So. Because you've come here and you, you've seen this talk, now you know that uh, if you want to use the standard, don't use SHA-3, use Shake instead. Uh, it will be faster and you'll get a more realistic security. So yeah, I put that picture so you can remember Shake. It's very important. I'm gonna shake a bit so you can remember that. <laughs> but really, remember this thing, right? It's, it's, you're going to see it more and more in the upcoming years. So this Shake thing is so interesting that the, the year after, they released another thing called SHA-3 derived functions. And it's kind of a light, not SHA-3, it's shake, really. Or, but it's kind of the same thing also. And it's a new standard. 
So it's a standard by the NIST also. You can use it as a standard if you're required to use standards, um, American standards. Called SP-185, uh, same thing here. Don't look for that. Just look for derived shaft functions. Uh, released last year, right? Almost two years ago. And it's pretty recent. And it's kind of confusing. Every time I, 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 I ask people if they know these functions, either they know it and they don't really understand what's what, or they just, they just have never heard of them. So actually, let me ask you, anybody here has heard of any of these functions? All right, one, one person. So, well, that's a good thing. I'm, I'm going to tell you what are these three functions that are in the standard. And you're, hopefully you can understand what they are for and maybe use them or recommend them to your clients or your team or whatever. So let's start with the first one, but for that one I need to first kind of put a problem in your hands. So imagine that you want to send a message to your good friend Bob, and you don't care about encrypting the message, right? You just want to send a message across the wire like that. But you really don't want to, anyone to be able to intercept that message and change it, modify it. So one way to do that, that's my idea, I'm going to send a message and I'm going to append the hash of the message. So like that, when Bob receives the message, he can hash the message with SHA-256, which is SHA-2, with 256 outputs, and see if the, the hash appended to that message is the same, matches. If, if it's the same, then he can say, okay, nobody has modified that message. So is that thing secure? No? no. Why not? Because if you intercept it, you can change the hash as well as the message. All right, so, so if you intercept it, you can change the message and recompute the hash over the new message. Yeah. The hash is public, anybody can do that. All right, good. If you didn't know that, this is Crypto 101. So it's very good to know that. Uh, something we see a lot when we do pen tests, like people just don't know these things. All right, what if I put a key in there? Is that better? So, yeah? Uh, you can still replay the same message. You can still replay the same message. Right, so you can still replay the same message with that construction. So that's true. You can still replay the same message with that construction. <laughs> Thank you. So that's true. But let's say we don't care about replays. Okay. Just so that everybody understand that I and Bob share the same key. So when Bob receives the message, he can recompute the SHA-256 on the message, append it to the key. And only Bob can do that. So nobody can modify the message and recompute the, the hash because there is a key in there. Yeah, the key is secret, right? The key is secret, right? So it's a shared secret. It's a shared secret. It's a symmetric secret. That's the word. So that, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good point. But here, let's say that we don't care about replays. Anybody knows what kind of sneaky stuff we can do? Length extension attack? So yeah, that's right. So OK, uh, very good. One more beer. <laughs> So basically what an attacker can do here is that he can add more, add more to the message and then obtain the hash of the key appended to the message, appended to something more. So that is called a length extension attack. SHA-2 is vulnerable to this kind of abuse. Of course, if you use SHA-2 without a secret, just as a hash function, it's fine. SHA-2 is, is solid. But if you use it this way with a secret in it, in it you're looking for troubles. So yeah, this is called length extension attack. I'm not doing, going to explain how it works. Um, if, you, yeah, if you're more interested in that, you can just Google it, or there's a website called CryptoPals where you can actually implement the attack as an exercise. Um, anyway, Shake, SHA-3, or any SHA-3 contenders back then uh, in the competition is actually not vulnerable to this length extension attack. And so you can just use Shake with a key and a message, and it works. Uh, so you can do that yourself, but there is something called KMAC that does that for you, and it has a bunch of implementation um, optimizations. So I would, I would uh, recommend you to just use KMAC or recommend KMAC if you have a use case for that. So MAC means message authentication code. So usually you use something like HMAC. Uh, so KMAC is something like that. All right, so every time you can kind of guess from the name what the, the construction is for. So here, KMAC, the key, a MAC. All right, tuple hash. Okay, before I, I go to that slide, uh, anyone here using some end-to-end -end encrypted message application? 
Why? Why? Almost everyone. <laughs> not, not everyone, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so if you don't know how that works, usually uh, you retrieve, again, your friend's Bob, uh, public key, and then you can encrypt to that public key your messages. So here we pretend that uh, public keys in our system, I don't know what, uh, that's the David Wong uh, chat app, okay? Uh, our public keys are RSA public keys. If you don't know how RSA public keys work, there are basically two numbers, E and N. E is a very small number, sometimes something like three, uh, and N is a very, very large number. And the larger N is, the more security you have. So here uh, I have a system where everybody has a public key and you can encrypt your messages to somebody's public key. So is that enough? Uh, any, so the people who just raised their hand earlier, has anybody actually verified that you're, you're using the right public key when you're encrypting messages for your friend? Anybody done that? Just one person? All right. You can get it signed by other people. I can get it You can get the key signed as well by other people, so that verifies the Can, can, can you do that, though? By a trusted third party called CA. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what messaging application are we talking about? Because I've never seen that. Well, GPG does that. But it's GPG does that, yeah. but it's not a messaging app, right? It's not something you can use on your phone. So usually, what you're not required to do, but what you can do is that you can verify a fingerprint or a safety number, uh, depending on how they call that. And basically, you take your phone, you click on Bob, compute something, shows you like a QR code or some numbers, and Bob do the same, does the same thing. And you meet in real life or out of band, wherever, and you compare these things. And if they match, then you're sure that the server that gave you this public key didn't lie to you. Or just you didn't get the public key of someone who's pretending to be Bob. So if you, you've never done that uh, homework, when you go home, check that thing and check that your friends are indeed your friends and you're not getting mad in the middle. Um, all right, so what's a fingerprint? What's a safety number? What, what are these things? Well, one example of that would be to just hash my RSA public key, okay, or Bob's RSA public key. And when I go see Bob in real life, uh, I compute this hash on my phone. Bob computes this hash on his public key also, and it should match, right? If I'm talking to Bob, it should match. If I'm talking to someone else who is pretending to be Bob, then it shouldn't match. So, is this secure? Okay. Does this work? Is there a way for an attacker to create another public key, different public key, that would hash to the same thing. So that the fingerprint would be the same and I wouldn't be able to notice that it's I'm being man in the middle when I verify that with Bob. So is this thing secure? I'll give you a hint. Uh, so I'm hashing this series of bits where the, the E number is in blue and the, the N number is pretty big, is in red. So is there any way to create a different, yes? <laughs> I'm not 100% sure this is what you're going to get at. But, right. uh, I mean, we just went through it previously in the talk that SHA-256 is broken. So you could uh, have a collision, and that collision could cause you your key to have the same fingerprint as someone else's key. So so there is no collision into SHA-256 yet. But, oh, really? Or we're not expecting any collisions. OK, well, I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Anybody else? What could I what could I do to create a different public key that would hash to the same thing here? Factor it? No, that's too complicated. I don't want to. N is too small. N is too small? Well, well let's say that it's reasonable size. All right, this is a secure key. Yes? What if you change E? So if you change E, so you want to change If you change those bits, it's going to hash to a different thing, right? You change any bits in this. Yeah. And this series is going to give you something completely different. If you change E so that the full thing inside the charge function is equivalent to a whatever. Hello. If you change E to be equivalent, like I'm probably going to be wrong again, but I'm just saying this. Uh, if you change E so that E plus N is equivalent to whatever the other person's uh, key is, with including their E, then. Uh, I guess you'd have a collision there. And so you so you're, you're saying that E is not the full length of this thing? E includes the, uh, you you change E such that your uh, private, your public key um, now 
uh, includes a portion of the public key you're trying to imitate, and E uh, like helps you do that as a buffer. Like, yeah. like that thing that you've right. got on the board there, yeah. Right, did, I, cool. did I get it right? Can you tell yes, me? yes, that's I, right. That's I, I feel good about myself, thank you. <laughs> Well, be everybody understand that, right? You, you take exactly the same series of bits, except that you say that E is the same E, and then you steal bits from N, and you continue using E, and then you say that N starts here, instead of starting here. So the same series of bits, you're hashing that, gives you the same hash, right? No questions? All right. Sorry, what? So that's that's a public queue, right? So the, the, the attacker could just try to ask Bob, to communicate with, communicate with Bob and would get the public key. What is E? Like what is E? Yeah. So I said it's just a, a small number. Where does the number come from? Hi. Hi again. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've been watching your presentation so far, and I don't no. understand where E came from. You said that it's a very small number, but like I was assuming it was some kind of initialization vector that was common to all of the SHA constructions. Sorry, all of the RSA constructions. How is it that we can change E, and where does that E come from? Because obviously, two different people should, in theory, have the same E, right? In order to in order to end up with the same fundamental fingerprint. So, so I'm not really going to reply to that because that's explaining to you how RSA works, and okay. it's not my talk. Okay. But just a quick explanation: the N really matters here. So people tend to choose the same E. Yeah. And when you encrypt a message, actually, what you do is that you raise your message to the power E modulo N. Yeah. So. E usually doesn't matter as long as n is different. Uh -huh. So we choose a small e because when you raise a message to a small power, it's faster. Okay. It's like that is faster to encrypt. Okay. But that, that's the only thing I'm going to say. Uh, you, you can talk to me after, but I'm yeah. not going to. Thanks. I think I understand a little bit more. Put too much now. on the tangent here. All right. Ask a related question. Yes. Uh, so if you've done that, how hard is it then to get the private key and not just the second public key? So after. So if I do that, how hard it is to get the private key from this public key. All right, so that's one thing I didn't touch. Okay, we created a different public key, but maybe we cannot decrypt messages, right? So it's useless. But what we can do if we, do, if we make n smaller and smaller and smaller is that we can make it less secure, and then we can break the key and retrieve the private key associated with that public key, and then we can use it to decrypt messages. All right? Cool. All right, I guess we're, we're gonna move to the uh, next slide. If you have more questions on that side, you can ask me at the end. All right, last construction called parallel hash. Here you can guess again uh, what, what it does. Um, so imagine that you're hashing large inputs, large files. What you have to do is that you have to absorb your message and you have to do a lot of permutation, right? You will have to divide it in many, many blocks and do a lot of permutations. And that's kind of slow. So one thing you would want to do maybe is to parallelize that construction to, to make it faster. So let's say that we want to parallelize or execute that in parallel to the other permutation, this permutation. What do we need? We need the output of this permutation, right? Because this output goes into this permutation. To get the output of this permutation, we need the output of this permutation. So everything is very sequential, right? But yeah, it's a chain, right? So it's you, a need, chain. you need the previous one. Right, which is sometimes good, sometimes it's not that good. So for hashing passwords, maybe you want something like that. Uh, something slow, but here, not so much. So what can we do? So there's a very easy way to fix that. It's called tree hashing. I don't know if you can all see that. But basically, you split your large input into manageable um, blocks. You hash those blocks separately. Here, you're using check, and you create a smaller output. And at the end, you hash the whole thing together. And like that, you can parallelize the hashing of all the blocks so it's faster, and at the end, you just have a small hash to do. Make sense? OK. Can uh, some number of uh, blocks in there, does it matter? How do you determine how many parts to split your so, large file? So I believe the standard uh, kind of did that heuristically and tried different values. And I think a block is something like 8,000 bytes. So that's uh, that would be for something bigger than 8,000 bytes. And if you, anybody can tell me something wrong with that construction, what about small inputs? What about small inputs? I guess with small inputs, you can't use the split into chunks. The chunk, is, the chunk size is larger than the input. Yeah, you, you just don't split it. You just use it as one, one block, right? One chunk. Okay. So you can still use that construction for small inputs. But there is something bad for small inputs here. You can end up I what? 
padding it. Uh, if you remember this construction, I don't really need to pad if it's if it's smaller than. Or here it's different, but it doesn't matter if we pad it or don't pad it. We can still use it. But there is something bad here if it's a small input. Don't you see like the, the double check? So we get a penalty if it's a small input because we hash twice, which is not that fast, right? Like usually we just hash once. Did I skip double hash? Oh, yeah, so it's double hash, sorry. Going back to double hash. Um, so a parallel hash is a way to, to hash large inputs, but it's not so good with small inputs. Tuple hash is a way to hash something without ambiguity. So I believe it's the only standard that you have today that allows you to hash an object, a structured object, like an RSA public key, without any ambiguity. So what we do is that we just hash the length of E, E, the length of N, and N. So we include the length every time, so we cannot just change the, the size of the objects. Okay, any, any questions on all any of these functions here? Okay. Uh, the parallel hash is basically a hash of a hash, right? So you're hashing the same thing twice. If it's a small input, well, if it is yes. a small input, right? But if it is a large input, you'll have to hash three, four, five times, right? So you know that you're, you, you're always going to have a minimum penalty of double hashing. Yeah, but for large inputs, since you can parallelize these, these, um, these checks, these instances of check, then it's faster. It ends up being way faster. Okay. So, yeah, recap, uh, SHA-3 and check in the main standard, yeah? Can you give examples of um, where are they used? Uh, examples, yeah. So, I haven't, so part of the hash was uh, um, recommended to Git. If you've heard of it, Git was using SHA-1, and SHA-1 is broken, so they were trying to find a new replacement. Uh, so they, they were looking at parallel hash. I don't know if they chose it. I actually don't know what hash function they chose, or if they chose something yet. Tuple hash, I've never seen anyone using it, but one of my clients was vulnerable to similar attacks, so I recommended that to them, and they actually implemented it. So I know one, one person who does that, but I cannot tell you who. Um, KMAC, I haven't seen anyone using it. This is pretty recent, right? This is. This is last year stuff, so do you have a question or <laughs> question here? Yes. So you said parallel hash, you are choosing it because it's faster. So but I see like you are again like this one. So you said parallel hash is for being faster, right? Mm -hmm. So but I see like you are doing one at least minimum of one hashing uh, extra. Right? How is it faster? So so remember here we have large inputs? And we hash blocks, we divide our inputs in different chunks, we call that chunks, and then we hash those chunks separately. So a chunk is smaller than the, the, the real input, right? So we can hash that in a smaller amount of time and you can do a bunch of them in a simultaneously. Right, so this assumes the, that if you have, a, say, one gigabyte file, if you split it into two, 10 uh, chunks with 100 meg each, right? Right. Uh, that you're saying that it's faster to hash 10, 10 hundred meg files than one one gig one. Yeah, because you can basically it takes the time to hash one gigabyte file, right? So the hash of a say one megabyte or one gigabyte file is pretty will be smaller than that one message, right? That's what you're saying. Uh, can you repeat that? Yeah. So the hash of the uh, whatever the value we're getting will be smaller than the original one. So yeah, so so here from this shape, I, I can't remember exactly, but the output is I, th I believe is smaller. Okay. So at the end, what you're shake, what you're shaking here, what you're hashing at the end is is way smaller than your your first input, right? It's, it's very small, so it's very fast. Yeah. By the way, what's the uh, bit length or byte length of shake output? Uh, well, that's what I told you, right? It's, it can be anything you want. Yes, yeah. it's SHA-256, we know what it is, right? <laughs> right, it's 256 bit, but for shake, it's anything you want. You have to choose it yourself. Uh, there, there's a page on the internet, if you look for it, uh, where you can uh, kind of tune and you can choose your output length and it tells you what kind of security you get. Uh, so that can be useful. All right, just two last mentions before I finish with uh, these. There is an open competition 
like SHA-3 and AES called Caesar, and it's uh, focused on authenticated encryption. So think of something like AES GCM. And it's not finished, it's ongoing, it's very slow, so I don't know if it, it will finish one day. Uh, but there are several candidates that use this sponge construction for something like AES GCM to replace it. And there are two algorithms using exactly the permutation inside of SHA-3, uh, KYAC and KT. So if one day we get hardware support, and I believe ARM just added that to their uh, instruction set, uh, but if we get more general hardware support for SHA-3, we'll have support for maybe encryption, maybe something, the next AES GCM, hardware support for hashing, and much more. So that's, that's interesting. Not going to explain that, but just wanted to mention that. Uh, and finally, last mention, uh, SHA-3 is very slow, I was saying, or not very slow, but is, is uh, not fast enough for some people, let's say big players who really, really, really want to optimize things. Uh, so the Ketchak team came up with two new algorithms that are based on SHA-3, so it's uh, the, the same security uh, basis, but it has the same kind of parameters as Shake, it's an extendable output function. It has tree hashing by default, so you can hash large input very, very quickly, but it doesn't have that penalty. So you can also hash uh, small input very quickly. Um, and it's, it's so fast that they have this diagram here that just kind of shows you, for whatever input, it's fast, like almost twice as fast as parallel hash, SHA-1, SHA-2, SHA-3, etc. So it's a very, very ha uh, fast hash function that is fast for large inputs, small inputs, that is flexible because you get this output length that you can choose from and it's more mature. That's, that's basically what they created after uh, some years understanding how hash function works and how standards work. But it's not a standard. It, it has a draft RFC, so if you want to use it um, but you're required to use a standard, then uh, it's not a standard. So yeah, that's the last slide I have recap, recapping all the this, this functions I was talking about. Again, if you want to check any of these functions, uh, from KIA, KTA, the, the hash, the shake, whatever, you can check that web page. They have implementations for that. Uh, and that's basically it. So I have a last part, but I don't know if I have time to go over that. I do? Okay. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay, I can give you kind of a glimpse of what is happening in terms of protocols uh, in the crypto world, ap applied crypto world. So cool, we have hash functions, we have other kind of functions, but we have something else. So to introduce the problem, let's look at the diagram again. That's SHA-3, that's the sponge construction, okay? We're absorbing and then we're squeezing. What if we, after squeezing a bit, we absorb again and then we squeeze again and then we absorb again and then we squeeze again? What, what stops us from doing that? And actually nothing really stops us from doing that and that's what the Kitschak team thought and they came up with a new construction called a duplex construction, which is basically that you can absorb, Squeeze, absorb, squeeze, absorb, squeeze. All right, what is the good in that? Well, imagine that you put a key in your thing, in your sponge, in your state. Okay, you absorb it. And here I want to, to kind of tell you one thing that I might not have make, uh, it wasn't maybe clear for everyone here, but if you somehow leak the secret part here, we never touch the secret part, right? We never read it, we never touch it. If you somehow leak it, then remember this permutation is kind of like AES with a non-key, right? Everybody can decrypt. And so if you leak this part, basically everybody can retrieve the key. So secret part has to remain secret. It's very important. So here we have a key. So it's a key mode. It's not like hashing stuff. It's, it's a very different mode, different security properties. And what can we do with a key? We can encrypt, right? So how do we do encryption? And that's a question for you again. Remember, I, I absorb a key in my state, I permute, so here I get something kind of random. Here I get a, if I just read the public part, I get a series of random bits. How can I use that to encrypt? Any ideas? It's not a trick question. <laughs> XOR. XOR. So, actually that has a name, it's uh, the one time pad, uh, if you know that. So you basically XOR your plain text with this thing, with this series of random bits, and it encrypts it. And how do you decrypt it? Well, you do the same, you generate the same kind of a random bit sequence, you XOR that with the ciphertext, and you get the plain text back. All right? 
Right, when you XOR, your message with random bits gets random, right? Okay, so we never encrypt like that. Usually we authenticate or we protect the integrity of our ciphertext. Otherwise someone can come, flip bits in the ciphertext, and the same bits are flipped in the plain text, like a one-time pad. So how can we do that? Well, we just, the same way we did previously for hashing, we absorb our plain text, we permute, and what we created out of our plain text and the key is our authentication tag. So we give that next to the cipher text, and the person decrypting the message can absorb the plain text recovered, generate that thing, and if it's the same, then he knows, she knows that it hasn't been modified. If it's different, then the plain text was different, and that means it has been modified, right? This kind of looks like blockchain to me. Blockchain? Very different. <laughs> All right, so here that's cool, but what if we continue? We decide to encrypt something after and create an authentication tag again. Well, that's what we call session, and the idea here is that we can just keep going and keep encrypting or keep decrypting something, and we don't use any IVs or nonces. It's not complicated like ASGCM or any of these algorithms. And every time you obtain an authentication tag here, you authenticate the whole transcripts. So that's very interesting in a, se in a sense because nobody is able to modify a message in the middle, to add a message, to reorder messages, to drop a message in the middle. You must have the same sequence of message, otherwise, otherwise the tag will be different. So this idea of session is really interesting, and that's what uh, Strobe used. So Strobe is a protocol framework. It's a specification that you can read on the internet. And it allows you to create pretty much uh, symmetrical protocols. So very quickly, uh, I guess I'm running out of time here, uh, but what you would do, this is a very simple explanation of how you would use this protocol. Uh, you would instantiate your protocol with a, some, some sort of custom string, for example, mywebsite.com or myprotocol. You would do that on both sides of the connection, client and server, or peer and peer. You would insert a key in there with a function called key that Strobe provides. So you absorb a key in your state. Uh, the key is a shared secret. Uh, you can get it from a key exchange, for example, or just a secret, secret key that you share on both ends. And after that, you can encrypt a GET request, for example, generate an authentic authentication tag. And on the other side of the connection, you can do the reverse operation, receive ANC to decrypt, and receive MAC to make sure that nobody has modified the ciphertext. And then if it's not correct, then you can reset the connection. So a very simple example, you have a bunch of these functions that you can use uh, via strobe, and you can mix and match them, and you can create a bunch of different things. And you can just use it, for example, by itself to create a hash, you instantiate it as a hash, you absorb your message, and you generate a series of random bits, that's your hash, or that could be random numbers, if that's a key. So you can generate random numbers, you can derive keys from that uh, by using kind of the same functions. So you can do many, many things. And that's kind of the cool part, so I'm gonna skip all of that where I explain basically what happens in that sponge construction. Uh, but yeah, so that's a specification. The cool part is that it all relies on SHA-3. So it's a solid standard, it's secure. If we have hardware support one day, it's super cool. <coughs> And you can do many, many things, not just a protocol, but also uh, deriving keys, generating random, random numbers, and all your symmetric crypto for uh, something like a thousand lines of code. So it's extremely small library, uh, very easy to audit, and extremely powerful. So this is experimental, but I believe this is something that is going to be uh, more and more used in the future, especially for IoT uh, and these kind of things. So, yeah, I'll just say briefly that I'm working on something to extend this stroke protocol. Not going to explain that, but there is something called noise that is basically something like TLS, but more modern. Uh, and I'm trying to merge that with Strobe, and I call that Disco. Uh, you can see more about my product on Disco Crypto, which is not really up to date right now, but um, I'll be talking at Black Hat in two weeks on that subject. So by then, it should have a better uh, content on the webpage. And yeah, if you want to know more about that, or more about crypto in general, or security, or, or that kind of stuff, I write a lot on my blog there. Uh, so go and take a look. Uh, I say a lot of stupid things on my Twitter, uh, so go and follow me, that's an order. And yeah, if you have any kind of crypto questions, uh, 
related to security. I work at NCC Group. I'm a security consultant there, so it's my job to look at applications like TLS or um, block ciphers, LT curves, secure messaging applications, whatever that is related to crypto. So I can help you if you're a consultant or if you're more of a developer, I can help you also uh, for this. And that's it. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. All right. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of questions. Any questions? Yeah, lots of questions. Uh, sorry, I keep talking. No I worries. apologize for that. Um, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first question is, you showed this graph that showed the relative speed of various different algorithms and showed that the kangaroo algorithm, I don't remember the name. Kangaroo 12. Kangaroo 12. What happened to the first 10 kangaroos? They will never know. Sorry, I keep telling jokes. Um, yeah, the kangaroo exactly. algorithm was faster than everything else. Is that excluding like uh, A6 that might be on the CPU? Like, I don't know a lot about this stuff, but uh, I know the CPUs have special circuitry that does this really, really fast. Did they exclude that as part of the test, or like, is it genuinely running faster despite the fact that there are on silicon dev uh, devices designed to do, for example, SHA-256 fast on modern CPUs? So uh, usually, you would use. I think SHA-2 has hardware support, and uh -huh. I'm not sure it's everywhere. SHA-1 has, of course. Uh, but for Kangaroo 12, you don't have hardware support. Right. Uh, so what you would use are CMD instructions, uh -huh. thing that can uh, operate on 120 bits or 256 bits at the same time. Yeah. I think usually they use that for video games, but we also. So the question I'm crypto. asking is like, for this test, did they disable the application-specific circuitry that does SHA-512 really, really fast? Oh. Because that's not built into the CPU yet for Kangaroo 12, I'd imagine. So that's a good question. I actually am not sure. Because like, for me, when I read this, the thing I think is like, if they have disabled the A6, and I feel like they would on something like this, then SHA-512 may well be faster on a typical consumer CPU, right? That, that sounds correct, but I'm not sure. So the best thing to do is check on the Kangaroo 12 website and okay. see how they did that. Okay. I actually have a second question for that. I additionally apologize. No um, so like, you recommend a lot of this new crypto and uh, being scared of many things. I'm scared of new crypto as well. Like, uh, I've always been told as a security engineer, and I tell myself every day that like, using, this, using really new crypto is dangerous because like, the attacks for it haven't been explored. Um, you recommend a lot of these newer constructions, and I wonder, like, how much does the newness of these functions factor into your impression of their security? As somebody who's not a cryptographer, like, the fact that these constructions haven't existed as long as SHA-2, for example, makes SHA-2 seem like a, a better choice, at least for now. Right. So, so different things. So I'm not telling you to move away from SHA-2. For example, if you're using SHA-2 nowadays, and you're using it correctly, right? Without a key inside, yeah. without a secret inside, okay. then it's perfectly safe and you don't have any good reasons to change your code ap application uh -huh. and everything. Now, SHA-3 isn't that new, right? It was invented um, 2012. Uh, yeah. yeah, 2012 or... Did no, it become a, did 2007. It become a standard in 2007? Right, so it was invented in 2007. Yeah. Received a lot of analysis. Yeah. Uh, at this point, it's pretty solid. It's, it, Okay. You can trust it, it's a standard, it's not for nothing. Um, so at this point, SHA-3 is completely safe to, to recommend. Kangaroo 12 is completely based on the cryptanalysis of SHA-3, uh -huh. so it's safe to recommend as well. I think for these kind of functions, relies on SHA-3 as well, it's safe to recommend. Yeah. No, I think it's better for anybody here to understand in what context you can use these functions and in what context uh, you're making mistakes because you're not using something like that. So I think the lesson here is more important when you understand that, oh, I was doing something like tuple hash, but I was actually not, I was vulnerable to that attack I was previously mentioning, then it's important. So I'm not too much recommending you to use these things. I'm just telling you, these are there. These may be solutions to the problems that you didn't realize you had uh, because you were vulnerable or something like that. Um, for the stroke thing, and the disco thing I'm working on, all of this is experimental. This is just a glimpse of what uh, we're working on now that might be something more mainstream in, I don't know, five years, 10 years, I have no idea. Right? But there is no recommendation to use that now. Kind of a follow-on from the last question. Yeah. Um, where there is hardware support on some processes for certain types of encryption, there is also suspicion about 
how that uh, encryption may have been subverted. And I know that, for instance, in Debian, you can pick whether you want a package compiled with hardware support for certain forms of encryption or not, because the software code can be audited, the hardware acceleration not so easily. Has this factored into any of this that you, from your studies at this point, I appreciate it's a vast field, it's not meant in any way as criticism, just a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you're saying that maybe AES support, like the hardware AES support might be backdoor or something like that, if I understand. It might be compromised. Right. So I, I'm saying if you're running code on an Intel CPU or something like that, anyway, you're trusting your CPU, right? So either you use their shortcuts and it's faster, or you don't, but they can still backdoor the random number generator or something like that. So in the end, you got to trust the platform you're, you're using, I, I, I'd say that. And the performance boost you get from hardware support is non negligible. So it's not even like you're having a choice and people will usually choose things where they have hardware support. Now, if you don't care about that, as I said, you still have the, oops, you still have the random generator issue and it's still something that is derived from your CPU and, and stuff. So yeah, the trust issue is all the way totals. Ethereum or Bitcoin? <laughs> Ethereum, because I have more <laughs> Ethers than uh, Bitcoins. <laughs> so I'm personally invested in that. Also, I think it's really cool because you can create your applications on top of that. If you go on my blog, I created a 4chan for the blockchain. So basically, I cannot erase anything. There is no censorship. Uh, so check it out, but there are some goods. So don't kind of squint when you're looking at the thing. That, that answers your question. We should be asking this uh, probably down at the pub, but heck what, uh, we can all benefit. Uh, I miss big time on investing in Bitcoin. What's the next big cryptocurrency we could uh, all oh invest in? I, you shouldn't listen to me, so I always give bad advice, <laughs> besides crypto advices. Um, so uh, personally, I think Ripples might have uh, some potential. It's pretty low and it's pretty uh, misunderstood right now, so there might be something there. Uh, Ethereum, I think, is uh, today it went up uh, to like 420. It's like an all-time high, and I think it keeps going up. So, if I were you, I would get some ripples in Ethers. But, but I don't. If you lose money, it's not my fault. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, guys? Uh, sure. Do we have any questions online? No. Okay. I have one question. So I remember when you talk about strobe, right? So this cool thing, uh, she using protocol. So my understanding is it, it was a bit like a ledger, right? So this is why I said. So you have like authenticated communication where you could prove at that point that every single bit of communication was authenticated. You can, right. Yeah, you can think about that in this way, but yeah. it's I'm just I'm just asking for the, for the like practical application. I know you showed a bit of HTTP communication, right? Which would usually be protected with TLS, right? Which will be in the secure channel. But can you have some examples of uh, application of Strom in real life? So application would really be so it's very different from any ledger stuff because uh, these use public key cryptography and this is completely symmetrical, right? So two different fields in cryptography. Um, so applications would be really any protocol that you use on the internet. So TLS, uh, secure messaging, TLS on TCP. So anything that requires messages to come in a certain order and where you really want to assure that nobody has reordered messages. So that's something also in messaging. Uh, you don't want anybody to be able to reorder messages or drop messages in, in the middle and you wouldn't be aware or that kind of things. So, so the question I had with that is above confidentiality and integrity, what exactly does the authenticity assurances do? So, so can you repeat that? So you have, above. for example, with cryptography, a lot of the, so hashes, for example, show integrity, you know, mm -hmm. that, the so so the hash doesn't provide integrity. Well, remember my example. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, they can show yeah digital signatures or so on to show non repudiation and that kind of thing. But I was wondering about authenticity. So authenticity, so authenticity is kind of a old school term. Yeah. That a lot a lot more people refer to as integrity nowadays, uh, but we still use authenticity when we say authenticated encryption or a message authentication code and stuff like that. But what we really mean is protecting the integrity of what you're sending. Okay. 
So, and usually, so a lot more people have started using that in the crypto world. And in the applied world, a lot of people still think that a hash function provides integrity. So I think it's better to understand that integrity has something that is provided by something like KMAC or signatures or that kind of things. So that you don't make the mistake. Is that answering your question actually, or I'm not sure? Keep talking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, everyone. Let's thank David for uh, for his talk. <laughs> okay. So here is the uh, last bit. So uh, I would like to thank our speakers, uh, Thomas and David, for their amazing talk. Talks. Thank you very much, guys. One more time. <laughs> uh, I would like to remind you that slides will be published on nowas.org and the video recordings will be available on YouTube and I believe Facebook will automatically save the live stream so you'll be able to watch this again from home. I would like to thank our hosts for this event which is the Telegraph Media Group and CISO Stefan Freeman. Thank you very much for having us here. And many thanks to you guys for taking three hours of your time to come and uh, um, see talks about application security. Now. Big announcement. So we have this guy. You know this guy. Is. He's the guy, the pioneer of application security, Jeff Williams, the guy who founded uh, OWASP. He's actually coming to London next Thursday, and he will be presenting a talk. If you need a ticket, please talk to me because I think we have five spots available, and it will be live streamed also to Bristol. OWASP Bristol will be having the event in parallel, and there will be people in Bristol will be able to ask Jeff questions. That will take place at Just Eat near uh, St. Paul's. If you guys probably, uh, you, some of you have been to Just Eat even before, you know where it is. Um, right, so that's all I want to say. So that's for next Thursday. Uh, don't forget to uh, follow us to make sure you don't miss the, the next event. And this is where we're going, right? This is what it looks like. It's called the Victoria. The address is 1 Lower Belgrave Street, in case if you s get stuck somewhere and you need to find it on Google. This is what it's like. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And I'll see you in the pub. Thank you. Thank you.